I wanted to let you guys know that while you're, you're finding your seats, um, one of our, our new elders, Craig Nelson, has uh, agreed to lead a mission trip to Jamaica starting tonight, I think, if you want to get out of the snow and go. Um, so glad you guys made it here, hopefully safely, and if you're at home, hopefully you're warm and um, so we're about to do something that's kind of odd, strange, not just because we're a smaller group, but um, this whole thing we do of sermon and preaching, this idea of me, Pastor Chad, someone getting up to speak to you for 30 minutes on letters, reports, essays, things that were written two to 4,000 years ago, and to talk to you about that. I mean, you, you might have this in other kind of religious settings, but uh, non-religious settings, this is weird and different and odd to do this. So your job is to listen right, to take it in, to not fall asleep, and to get something out of this. And as, as a preacher, as a pastor, I, I think about preaching a lot. I don't know if you do this with your job maybe, or maybe you have kind of metrics for what was a good, uh, good um, profits, or how did, did your job go well, this task you did. But think about that with preaching for a moment. What, what makes for a good sermon? I mean, if I were to ask you, what was the best sermon you ever heard? My guess is you probably, I don't know, I don't know if you could name one. Maybe you could think of like the place, maybe the, the preacher, maybe it's a combination of things. Um, but let me just, you know, give an example for this of what makes preaching kind of odd and different and hard to measure sometimes how many of you remember what I preached on last week? KT, those of you at home, everyone is raising their hand, okay? <laughs> or how many remember, like, how many points I had last week? Honestly, I'm not sure how many points I had. <laughs> I have to go look it up. But, you know, every Sunday there's, there's points to a sermon, but that's maybe not even the most important part if you memorize the points or how many points there were. Even thinking back two, three weeks, if you remembered the points or remembered the text, does that make for a good sermon? I mean, you could think about like, is a, is a sermon good if it's, if it's funny, if it had like three and a half good jokes throughout it, if it's memorable? Uh, application. If it applied to you, you know, there was some sort of good story to it, uh, if you learned something, or if it was true, does, does truth make it a good sermon? Or maybe take the opposite, what makes for a bad sermon? I mean, if it's, if it's just really boring, if it's, you know, it doesn't apply, it's way too intellectual, does the scripture have anything to do with it being uh, not uh, a good sermon or a good sermon? So, this morning, I kind of want to, I want to ruin preaching for you. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, have you, any of you ever worked in a fast food restaurant? I came this close when I was in college to working at McDonald's. I had the uniform, I had done some of the training, and I, I'm so glad that I never did because I've heard that when you see the insides, the makings of fast food, you may never want to eat there again. Like, I, I love Taco Bell, but I never want to see how they make their food and their meat and whatever that stuff is. I, I like the taste of it, though. So part of what I want to do this morning is we, we talk about preaching from the book of Acts is to present a, a sermon from the book of Acts that I think is a, a model, a good sermon for different reasons, and to ruin preaching for you that you have this standard, this kind of set of 
rules or things to think through when I'm preaching or you go and hear somebody else, uh, that sermon preaching should have these elements to them. Now, I know I set myself up for something really terrible here because this may be the worst sermon you ever hear from me. That's, that's going to happen at some point in, in our lifetime. Um, there was a song about 20 years ago that came out. Uh, Jack Black had a band called Tenacious D. And he had this song called Tribute. And it was a tribute to the greatest song in the world. But the song, he said, sounded nothing like the greatest song in the world that he was singing. So this is a tribute, in some ways, to the greatest sermon in the world. So we're, we're traveling through the book of Acts. And last week, we talked about the first missionaries that were sent off. Paul and Barnabas, and they have John Mark that goes with them. And they're sent off. And now they they come to their next location in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. And Paul is given an opportunity to preach. And we have a number of different sermons and uh, speeches in the book of Acts. And I think look through them and to see uh, what do they mean for us in preaching. So we're going to do kind of two things this morning. We're going to see, kind of understand the sermon in its context, you know, why did Paul say these things to this audience, but I think use this as an example for preaching for us today and um, in our church and in others. So turn with me to Acts 13, verse 13. We'll read to verse 22. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in Dave the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. So Paul and Barnabas set off on this journey. They they leave from from Antioch, and they kind of make this this crescent shape um, up toward what is modern-day Turkey. They go to an island on Cyprus, And now they're going up into modern-day Turkey. And they go from Paphos to Perga to Pamphylia to Pisidia. Try and say that like ten times fast. And we get this little interesting bit about a third person, John Mark, who's been with them. And we find out earlier in chapter 13 that he he just goes along with them. just kind of a side note, but in chapter 16 coming up, this, this instance of John going with them and then departing, leaving, is kind of the, the beginning, the breaking up of Paul and Barnabas and their missionary journeys together. There's a sharp disagreement, this incident, over this, this thing. I mean, something happens where he leaves them pretty soon on this missionary journey. But they, they, they go into the synagogue And they hear from the law, the prophets. It's just kind of saying the Old Testament. There's readings from it. And Paul, Barnabas, they're they're kind of waiting. They're patient. They listen first. Uh, They're respectful. And then they are asked to talk to, give a 
a sermon maybe or, or essay, whatever they're inclined to do. So Paul gets up and he does this. He's, he seems ready. He seems to kind of know his audience because right away, what does he go towards? He goes toward the Old Testament. And that's kind of what he's doing. Right? He's just kind of walking through the Old Testament. He addresses the Jews and non-Jews. He kind of goes through the Exodus, goes through them kind of wandering in the desert through book of Numbers. Uh, he goes through the conquest of Canaan. It's kind of Joshua and Judges, then Samuel, King Saul, and David. He's just, he's walking through the Old Testament with them. But, but, but notice who the main character is this entire time. It's not about the Israelites. It's not about these kings. It is all about God. You can just look at all the verbs. I mean, from verse 17... The God of his people chose our fathers. He made them this. He led them out. Verse 18, he put up with them. He's the one destroying the nation. Then this this giving language, he gave them their land. Verse 20, he gave them judges. And God gave them Saul. Verse 22, he, he raised up David. Paul is trying to kind of show you the insides, the background, that it's not about The Israelites say to this, this great character, David, or this person, but it's all about God, who is the one who is in control, sovereign, working out this story. John Piper calls this sermon from from Paul the most God-centered, God-exalting, God-saturated sermon in the Bible. So this is kind of our first point I want to look at for, for preaching, is that biblical preaching, I'm going to use that word just, Biblical, because you find this sermon in the Bible, biblical preaching exalts God. It makes God the main character. So as Paul is just recounting the Old Testament, God's the main character. You know, when you think about your own life, it's not just your history, it's it's God's history of how he's shaped you, he's talked to you, he's, he's led you in different ways. Now, preaching should not exalt people or, or a pastor, or, or even sometimes preaching can be about kind of just character studies. Look how great David was, or look how great Paul was. No, the main character of the Bible is God. Francis Chan, uh, many of you have heard of him or heard him preach. He's a very gifted, um, just kind of preaches kind of his emotions on his sleeve, and I heard him talking just recently about this, this verse in 1 Corinthians 2. It says, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaim you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. <laughs> he, says, he says this. He says, my safety belt is, is sermon prep. He's not trying to brag. He's just saying, he says, uh, figuring out just how to deliver just r- right <laughs> to know how a sermon can't fail. I know how to keep people's attention. I figure that out. Even if the Holy Spirit does nothing, it's still going to be fine. I know how to put together a service with a band and the right order together where it's going to be fine. He's, he's talking to pastors. He says, when's the last time you spoke with much fear and, and trembling? He said, people used to, you know, drive to his church and they'd come to the parking lot and say, well, is, is Francis, is he speaking today? And if he wasn't, they'd be like, okay, we'll, we'll go to the next church. He says, he just wants to be so content in, in God, but, there's, there's something more than just the crafting of the sermon, making it all about us. I mean, I even follow this trap as a pastor. I like celebrity ser- sermons or pastors. I want to listen to this person. There's a conference we usually go to in, in February. We've gone the last few years. We didn't go this year because there were no big speakers. <laughs> when, when I preach, I don't want you to come away with Kevin was funny, or Kevin did this, or uh, I want you to come away with an experience of God. 
That's, that's a big part of what sermon preaching is. It's not memorizing the points, but it's about, did you experience God this morning? Come to this place where you are more in awe of who he is. More in love with him because you just spent time hearing from him in the word. Biblical preaching puts God first, exalts God. But, but Paul doesn't stop there. He exalts God and he's talking to Jewish believers. He could have just stopped there, okay, exalt God. But he says there's, there's more. It's not enough just to know there is a God. Look with me at verse 23. He goes on. Of this man's offspring of David, God has brought to Israel a savior. Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I'm not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But... God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. He, he's been saying all along that you know, God brought you out of Egypt. He, he gave you a king. He gave you these things. And finally, the most critical, important part of what God did was he, he gave to us, gave to the Jewish people a savior. Do you see that? He gave a savior. This word is repeated over and over uh, in verse 26. It's repeated, this idea of salvation, of a savior. This is kind of what Paul is going toward, that Biblical preaching is not only God um, exalting, but it's also Jesus-centered. It has the gospel as the heart of it. So he says that this God gave us a, a Savior. Now we, we use that word a lot, God, Jesus. But to think of it for what it actually means, the full weight of it, that Jesus has saved us from our, our sinfulness. You can all think through things this last week in your, your lifetime of the countless things that would be counted as sin, whether they're thoughts, words, actions, you know, against just things that God only knows personally, against your spouse, against uh, your friends, family. God saves us from that awful life. Because of that sinfulness, God's wrath, his anger is against us to punish us for those sins. And Jesus is our savior to redeem us, to, to step in our place. That, that, that wrath for our sin goes on Jesus. So we are saved from God's wrath. We are saved from, from hell where we are destined to go. That is the ultimate good news. Every sermon, every preaching, everything that we do, every teaching that we do needs to have Christ, needs to have the gospel truly at the center of it. Because if it doesn't, it's just some sort of self-help talk or a, a TED talk or how to live your life better. I mean, Paul shares the gospel. This is Jesus came to save you and then he just kind of walks through the story of Jesus, right? He just walks through that 
people didn't understand him. He was condemned. There's a lot of they language going on here. We saw that you know, God was doing this. God gave. He chose. He did this. Now it's, it's they language. The people in Jerusalem, they condemned him. Uh, they asked Pilate. They carried out until, but God did this. But all the while, God is, it seems to be in control because it's all this that the scriptures said they would actually do. I mean, a sermon can be interesting. It can be enlightening, heartfelt, emotional, true. But if it doesn't have Jesus and the gospel at the center, then it's just this kind of work-centered, motivational, uh, pray more, read your Bible more, give more money to church kind of a message. One of the couple good resources we, we've tried to tap into is uh, the, the Bible Project. The, the women's ministry are doing this seamless study too to look at kind of this overarching idea that when you look at the entire Bible, it says one story. It's all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all this one woven story pointing to Christ. So biblical preaching has to be about Jesus or it's just works centered. Let's read on and see what Paul does next in verse 32. And we, we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God, his own generation fell asleep and was lay with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. So Paul's sermon kind of, it, it switches gears here from kind of just uh, talking overall about kind of the Old Testament, talk about really the New Testament and what Jesus did to kind of exactly quoting, or close to quoting, Psalms. He's quoting from Isaiah. He quotes from Psalm 2 and then Isaiah 55 and then Psalm 16. He's going to quote from Habakkuk in just a little bit. But Part of this, I think, is he knows his audience. He's speaking to a very Jewish audience. They know the Old Testament. So he wants to show them, okay, here, here is Jesus coming out of the Old Testament. But I think it's also a, a, a good sign, a good thing for us to think about that biblical preaching is, is founded on Scripture. I mean, it seems redundant. Biblical preaching is founded on Scripture. But so many times, so many sermons, so many preaching is, is, is void of the Bible. But Paul wants to go here when he, he talks about Jesus. He says in the second psalm, there's this idea that, that, that God talks about a son, you are my son, and being begotten. There's there in Psalm 2. And then he wants to talk about the, the resurrection of Jesus, which was very hard for early Jewish, the, the Sadducees especially, to understand. He wants to go to there and say that these, these promises, these things about um, what seems like the Messiah or David, he, he attaches to corruption. You notice that word being repeated, that you know, no more corruption, or one would not see corruption anymore. And he says that David, he, he saw corruption. He died, his body decomposed, all those things. But Jesus did not. He looks to the scriptures he shows them that Jesus fulfilled these things. There was a church in uh, Missouri that um, I, I never went to because I was at a different church in Missouri, but we had some friends who visited this church, and they, they always called this other church the church of what's happening now. Um, they, they told me one time about this, this sermon that was preached, uh, very engaging and interesting, great stories, application. 
And the pastor ended the entire sermon with no, no scripture in the middle of it, but ended it with, and the truth will set you free. <laughs> Got some Bible in there right at the end. <laughs> that's, that's not biblical preaching. That's not using scripture to apply, to talk about what we want, or what God wants us to hear. Uh, I heard on, um, just watching Joel Osteen one time. He said, I'm not here to give you some theological truth or biblical insight. I'm just here to tell you what's on my mind. And I changed the channel after that. Don't, don't come to listen to me or another pastor or preacher just to listen to their great insights and thoughts. Come to hear this. <laughs> There's a passage where Jesus talks to disciples and, and they say to him, you know, where else can we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. That's what this is. This is one of our values as a church. We value, we say, biblical teaching, not just in our preaching, but in our, our Bible studies, that everything is about um, bringing the Bible to life, to make sense of it. Um, th this is difficult. <laughs> you know, I, when I go on vacation, we'll, we'll visit other churches, and I'm always interested in what the pastors are saying, to kind of hear what they're talking about. And a lot of times they'll kind of put the passage up, and I'll... I'll my Bible ready and open, and okay, there's, there's an introduction, there's kind of like a funny story, and then I'm just, I'm waiting, waiting. And then finally, maybe the last five minutes, they kind of get to the Bible and talk about that. Again, that's not preaching from the Bible. Now, anyone can, can pick a text and say, this is what I'm going to preach on. Um, the trick is to take this, to interpret it, the original uh, author to the audience, what are they saying, and then to interpret it for us today, to apply that. This doesn't always happen even in preaching. I, I, I encourage you to challenge me on these things too. Do I actually take what the author's saying and then to apply it to you? There's, there's a danger of saying even true things that are, are not found in the text of the Bible. I could go on about that, but I'm not going to. Um, let's see how Paul ends his sermon. Look at verse 38 to 41. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. This is how he ends his sermon. He calls for a response. He quotes from the book of Habakkuk. Look what he calls for. He calls for belief. Everyone who believes is freed. He, he's speaking to this Jewish audience again, and he's saying that these things that you've trust in the law of Moses, it, it doesn't really free you. It, 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 it encapsulates you. So the book of Galatians talks about so well that, that the law itself was, was just a, a, a way to show us our sinfulness, to show us God's glory, how we could not be good enough. But really it's only through the forgiveness of sins, this offer that is proclaimed to them, to you, to me. He calls them to believe and he even kind of warns them he says, you know, beware lest you'd be like these people Habakkuk's talking about that you don't even believe even if one tells you. A sermon can be uh, 
Again, interesting, funny, good, but if there's no call to do something at the end of it, then it's informative talk. It's just a TED talk. It's a history lesson. A sermon is a call to action. And look what happens after he calls for action. There's response. Let's finish this, this chapter up. Verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things would be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So Paul in his sermon, he calls for response and he gets many different responses from what he says. There's, there's some positive responses, right? Some are just, they're really interested. They want to hear more. Come back next, next time. And this huge crowd comes out. The whole city comes out. It says there, and then there's rejoicing. They're glorifying the word. There's belief. The word of the Lord spreads. The disciples are filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. But then there's this, this flip side to this negative response. There's jealousy. The Jews at first want them to come back. Come tell us more. And then as they see the huge crowd that comes, they, they start reviling Paul as he's speaking. You know, he's talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done. They're just kind of like, no, not true. Just reviling him, kind of trying to incite them, contradicting them. They drive them out of the country. Preaching is an odd thing because... It calls for response. And a response, I think, is, is necessitated, but it doesn't always happen. My wife and I went to a, a Valparaiso basketball game yesterday. It was at Drake. Drake played Valparaiso. We went to Valparaiso. It's our, our college we went to. It's where we met. We went to like an alumni lunch, and we were there at the Knapp Center cheering on our team and we were down by like 15 points, mostly. We came back very close in the end. It just, I don't know if you've been to the Nap Center, but you can just feel the, the crowd responding so much of the time. Uh, there was some point toward the end where there was a call made against Valparaiso, and the whole stadium is like booing, and oh, and I, was, I just kind of stood up like, come on, bring it on. There's something even about like, sports or this kind of visceral like I want to react I want to just interact in some way or, oh that's a terrible call the hearing of the word preaching no matter of the, the, the preacher the, the hearing of the word the truthfulness it should cause a reaction in us I just got to be honest, I find it very odd as a pastor sometimes. I grew up in a church, a Lutheran church, where you had to shake the pastor's hand as you left. And you had to say something like, great job, pastor. You know, oh, I liked you. I liked point three. That was very nice. You know, 
But sometimes I think we, we, we compartmentalize things in our American society that, okay, heard our sermon, okay, last song, go watch a football game or lunch, move on. But something should come out of you when you hear a certain response. Belief, rejection, joy. Um, now, there is this strange verse too that where it talks about the Gentiles and as many as were appointed to eternal life believe. Again, God is working. It's not about Paul. It's not about the preacher. Ultimately, it's about God doing something here to make them respond. And I believe that's true of even preaching today. Without the Holy Spirit here amongst us, this whole thing would be for naught. So to that end, I want to pray for us and pray for the Holy Spirit to make this idea of preaching, make this text, the gospel, applicable and known in our own lives. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I do ask you now to convict to show us Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill us with yourself, with, with joy, even in this hard idea of God, of you appointing people to belief and what that means. And God, I pray even now that you would uh, turn our hearts toward you. If there are some that we, we know or are hearing now, this idea of rejecting or not following you, that you would soften hearts. Holy Spirit, would you come to help us to worship you, to fall on our face, say we believe in you, Jesus, and the salvation, the gift that you offer. And we just pray this in Christ's name. Amen.